Nikki, what questions did you have? Because you had a list of things you wanted to go over. What was the number one on, uh, on the list for you? You know, there's so much that came out of the uh, conference at Susan, the Susan Summit. It was an amazing event and like my head is still spinning. <laughs> the conference was the first time I learned about the fact that there are neurologists who can become certified in EEG, certified electroencephalographers. And I know that they have a different, you know, approach about things and that the test is different. Just curious about like what the differences are in those two different certification processes and also how EEG clinicians can align themselves with those neurologist EEG clinicians so that we can, you know, make the, make the dream work as a team. Sure. It, it, you can become a, a quantitative EEG technologist certified, and that's a technical. Basically, you have the skill set to be able to chop up the EEG and process it with the software uh, competently, and that's a certification that you've got that technical skill set. Um, and then there's the QEG D, which is a, a little higher level of of uh, being able to uh, essentially analyze the outcome, not just process it, but analyze it. And that that requires obviously some sort of practice license, a, a professional license, in order to be able to make uh, diagnostic uh, suggestions about it and so forth. So, uh, um, but that, that's basically about the QEEG. And a neurologist, uh, well, neurologists and psychiatrists get the same uh, certification uh, to, to practice as a, a neurologist and psychiatrist. However, if, um, if you want to become an electroencephalographer, uh, which is a specialty exam about EEG itself. Uh, you, you, if you're a psychiatrist, you have to take a neurology residency before you can even take that exam. So it's a little skewed uh, uh, towards neurology, a little skewed, it's skewed. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> there's no, no way around it. But uh, um, you know, it, it's good to have a depth in neurology background for EEG because there's a lot of neurological circumstances that are uh, subtle things that you you know clinically are going to have to be aware of. And um, a neurologist, on the average, because you go through an EEG residency uh, program, you ex exposed to EEG for about six months on the average for a neurologist, and you may be the one who who signs all the EG reports in the hospital, and it's based on that brief exposure. <clears throat> an EEG electroencephalographer has a year and a half or more. And you can also become an epileptologist, which is a specialist in EEG in epilepsy. And that's a separate board exam. To complicate it even more, if you're going to work with young kids, there's a pediatric uh, board exam because the EG during the early years maturationally uh, th there's a lot of variance and that it requires some experience in that area um, <clears throat> and there's one last one and that's neonatal and <clears throat> that it, um, th there are patterns uh, in um, in a premature baby that re resemble patterns of a uh, older person dying, bursts that are gigantic followed by suppression, a trace alternant um, in, a, in a newborn, a premature newborn. And uh, you, you don't wanna misdiagnose that because you, you don't have the right credential. So um, EEG has layer after layer of a <clears throat> medical credential. Uh, 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 appropriately so, because neonatal EEG is dramatically different. Pediatric EEGs are dramatically different. And then, you know, just adult, normal adult EEGs uh, is complicated enough. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, the medical uh, electroencephalographer ends up being the ones who uh, read the EEG for medical purposes, uh, epilepsy, various encephalopathies, on occasion, some exotic things like cerebrovascular insufficiency or 
you know, uh, um, uh, uh, other uh, circumstances, but uh, they've got the medical credential uh, to make the diagnostic impressions about medical uh, issues, including epilepsy. Welcome to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast, featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman. He is the man who has read over a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. And a special thanks to our gold and silver supporters. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences Neuro Guide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. And if you sign up now, you can join Dr. Robert Thatcher at his house for a pre-course get-together December 9th. It's going to be a blast. What a better way to enjoy winter by being in Madeira Beach, Florida and earning up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. Mindmedia.com. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from mindmedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit mindmedia.com now. All right, Nikki Whitridge, thank you for coming on the Neuro Noodle Network podcast. Long time no see, my friend. I mean, hey, it's only been a week, but uh, it depends on how much you've been up to. <laughs> now, Nikki, now, Nikki we, we met for the first time live at the Susan Conference out in Cali. Could you give a little background on yourself for the uh, new listeners and watchers that are checking us out today? Yeah, I've been uh, into neurofeedback about eight years now. And for the first, I'd say six or seven, had no clue what I'm doing. And now at least I know how to talk about what I'm doing. So it makes like I seem like I do. Yeah, you know, I've been super lucky. Like I went to Neurofield Conference three years ago, got hooked up with Joe Castellano, who has since passed. Um, But Joe was a real uh, connector and just like lover of people. And he was really generous and like, putting my name out there and getting me connected with Jay and and a lot of other people in the community. And since then, a lot of stuff has really just taken off because it's a, it's a welcoming community of EEG people and enthusiasts and clinicians and technicians. Uh, Right now I'm doing the master's in applied psychophysiology at Saybrook, um, which I'm really loving and has also been like great uh, help in terms of connecting with more people and learning a lot of foundational skills. I am uh, working with Mary Tracy, who is currently my mentor for the uh, technician test for the QEG certification board um, and get to hang out with Jay every other Friday for two hours and watch him work his magic. And now I uh, get to hang out with you guys a little bit. And then, Nikki, I also want to say thank you, man, for being a loyal watcher, because believe it or not, I make mistakes and sometimes I put up videos that you can't see. And with EEG, you got to be able to see those lines. So thank you for keeping an eye on things. And all the loyal listeners and watchers out there keeping an eye on things. So, Nikki, how would you get into uh, neurofeedback? Because you've been in it eight years. You have people that are listening to the show like, huh, this is, I'm thinking about, I'm a psychologist. I'm thinking about getting into it. Or, uh, you know, I'm doing my undergrad, <clears throat> undergrad psychology. I'm thinking about getting neurofeedback. What piqued your interest? And if you could go back eight years, are there any any other course changes you would make? Well, as you know, I'm only 14 years old, so I was extremely young when I uh, when I got into it. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, honestly, I was uh, I was in college. I was somewhat depressed and inattentive and kind of like all over the place. And, uh, you know, listening to the Joe Rogan podcast. And Joe's got a lot of different kinds of people on the podcast, uh, but he happened to have Andrew Hill 
Um, and Andrew Hill is the, you know, the guy from Peak Brain LA and they have multiple clinics now. You know, he said after something like 12 or 15 sessions of doing SMR training, 12 to 15 hertz as well, uh, that he was basically, you know, free from his, the, the worst of his ADHD symptoms. That just surprised me. I was like, wow, you know, I could, I could make some progress on these issues that I'm working with, with something that wasn't drugs. So, and, and from there, I like just kind of looked it up online. I looked on the Reddit, new, uh, Reddit neurofeedback. I saw that there were people who were buying their own systems. This guy, Douglas Daly, who's still working in the field, um, he has this uh, website. If you go to TagSync, T-A-G-S-Y-N-C, he also calls it live complexity training. Um, he's a wild dude, a great guy. Um, I had I had the chance to meet him. But so he was, uh, you know, you could buy a, e a four-channel EEG device and like a dongle for the software and his protocols for, you know, not a crazy amount of money for the EEG world. I think it was like under 2K. Um, and so I just started, you know, fiddling around with it. And like I was following the instructions and sort of trying to grok the understanding that he was trying to bring to it. He has a lot of interesting sort of theoretical underpinnings to his particular style of doing neurofeedback, which is, is really interesting. And, you know, it was like, I, I made no progress whatsoever for two years. I was like weirded out by the gel in my hair. And, you know, I was getting the sensor placements wrong. And uh, funny enough, like that protocol actually was not ideal for me because I happen to have a decent amount of, you know, frontal midline theta and a decent amount of frontal alpha. And if you're not careful with how you set the thresholds for how it's rewarding the theta and alpha synchrony, you can basically just train up your theta and alpha amplitude and like basically make yourself a little more foggy. <laughs> I essentially had no success and then sort of made negative progress with it. And that turned me on to this idea that, you know, like getting a map of what's going on and doing some sort of an assessment would be valuable. And so that uh, turned me on to Pete Van Dusen's platform, the Brain Trainer platform, which is a form of sort of low cost assessment, which I think is really cool where you're using a four channel amplifier and taking, you know, five separate recordings so that you can see what's going on with the sort of 20 standard sites. Met a mentor in England who turned me on to neurofields and that's where I met Joe and everything kind of started to explode. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you guys have talked about this yet on the podcast, but uh, Jay, you were getting into a little bit of sort of your critiques of Z-score training. And, you know, Z-score training is where you're basically training someone in comparison to like a normative database. And um, I'm just curious if you could elaborate on those critiques and also maybe comment on, you know, whether any research has sort of addressed those um, over the whatever a couple decades that it's been around. Sure. The, there's a lot of people are doing uh, that kind of work clinically and they're reporting interesting results. So I'm not contesting the results. There was a meta analysis about neurofeedback uh, outcomes uh, for, for various protocols and uh, they uh, they found uh, an inadequate number of uh, published studies for Z-score and Loretta Z-score uh, style training uh, in journals that could be quoted in, in a proper journal. There's predatory journals out there. Uh, Beale's list of predatory journals is a good spot to look for something not to publish in. Uh, but if you publish in such a journal, <clears throat> a good journal won't let you quote something from those journals because they don't really have proper peer review and standards. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the overall meta-analysis of neurofeedback outcomes uh, didn't have enough uh, quality studies from those uh, kinds of areas in order to make a conclusion about them other than there needed to be more research for them. So um, the, that, that's basically just a matter of making sure where you publish is actually a journal that's worth publishing in. Uh, look at the impact factor, if it's below one, you're, you're burying your paper, nobody will see it, you know? So 
uh, the, uh, you know, pay, paying attention to where it's being published is an important thing. I started in the field before there was any evidence of anything having any efficacy for anything. There was alpha training from Camilla and SMR training from uh, Sturman and you know some discussion uh, from Eric Pepper of uh, some beta frequencies and a meditator that did concentration meditation. So there was, you know, uh, there was some EEG observations, but there weren't really any uh, real ap applications. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm used to, to uh, working with people with essentially a research application, uh, a, a rational approach clinically, uh, the, the client signs off on on the treatment uh, consent and a research release, and you, you proceed with the treatment. Anyway, uh, uh, our our field has moved forward um, uh, with the research, kind of following along behind the clinical innovation, and uh, that that's about how it normally is. You know, the, in any given year, you get a a, a a, a big burst of interest in a particular protocol or a particular approach. And if it's a real valid approach, that interest will still be there the next year and the year after, you know, the, 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 there'll actually be people that are using it to find it useful. Occasionally there's an application that pops up and it's a popular thing to try and it just kind of fades away because it doesn't really have, you know, the outcomes that are reliable or, uh, uh, has, has it, it didn't work out so uh, the, but the clinicians basically over time uh, end up with approaches and those end up having uh, studies that are done uh, at various levels <laughs> our field at one point people could kind of claim whatever uh, uh, could work and there, there weren't any accepted standards but um, APB and ISNR collaboratively uh, set up uh, standards for what kind of research quality had to be present for you to make what kind of a level of claim of efficacy. So uh, that, that comes in handy. And, you know, we, we give ourselves a leg up. There's a possibly efficacious, then probably efficacious, and then efficacious, and then specific, if, if in fact it's the best one of many approaches, you can call it a specific at that point. So. Now, Nikki, we all were just in Sioux Sun City. Sioux Sun City. It took me four days to figure out how the hell to say it. So we're, we're all together, about 70 of us. And uh, I I didn't stay for the uh, events because th it was being recorded. I came in and did little clips here and there, and I, I left the room. Now, Nikki, I know you were there. You consumed everything. What were some of the highlights? Because... You know, Mary Tracy and Jay put that thing together and there's going to be a, a recording coming out, a, a, a video event of that coming out. And to just pique the interest of people wondering what the hell went on in Sioux Sun City, because not necessarily everything that happens in Sioux Sun City stays in Sioux Sun City. What were some of the highlights for you, Nikki? <laughs> well, definitely some of it stays in Sioux Sun City. So <laughs> my lips are sealed. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually just, uh, we just presented, uh, Rebecca and I just presented, uh, about that event last night uh, at Saybrook and it was a lot of fun. I mean, the event was a lot of fun. I was, I was telling them like, it was the most fun week of my life. Yeah. You know, um, I'd say we got, uh, deeper and also like went kind of wider than any conference that I've been to. Um, I really enjoyed having you know, two or three hours a day with Jay, if you can imagine that. <laughs> and just having the chance to go deeper on some of the more challenging subjects and really having time to look through the EEG and, um, you know, just get a sense for how complex even that simple thing can be. Um, we got to have, you know, we got to have time with both Jay and uh, Ron Swatsina for a, a, a good deal of each day talking about either EEG or pharmaco EEG. Um, and I think a lot of people are interested in learning more about pharmaco EEG and all the different drug effects. And I definitely feel a lot more equipped to deal with that and also start to think about navigating the territory of, you know, working with the other people and someone's, you know, 
healthcare team who are really credentialed to do that. Um, we had a lot of speakers present about signal processing and machine learning and artificial intelligence, which was really exciting to me because it seems like that particular area is really growing fast. And now that was um, Dr. Rogina, right? Regina. Right. So Regine Eichler West gave a presentation sort of on an overview of like what machine learning is. Um, we had uh, Makoto Miyakoshi, I think his name from uh, SE Schwartz Center for Computational Neuroscience. Um, he's famous in the EEG lab circles. Uh, he, he gave a really beautiful presentation uh, along with um, Michael Villanueva called The Art of Dimension and, and sort of taking a step back and looking from like a first principles perspective on like, what are we really doing when we're doing some of these fundamental transformations of EEG data, even just taking the fast Fourier transform as an example and, and what's lost as a result of doing that and um, how, how we can think about, you know, things like database comparisons and, um, you know, pre post measures of you know neurofeedback success or lack thereof with um more appreciation for how multi-dimensional the eeg is and um how much you lose by compressing the time spectrum just into <laughs> into one thing <clears throat> you know it, that, that sort of stuff also, also happens to be kind of my interest is more the computational side of things um and it was amazing it, it was it felt like a great culmination then to have i think present at the end um, Daekun Kang, Kim and Sung Wan. Yeah, Sung Wan Kang. Uh, you know, they're just all stars. They've been working with Jay for a long time. They work with Yuri on the development of their database. Um, they've been working with all the great people and they have created an, an, a really incredible vertically integrated sort of EEG system where there's the cap that you know, is sort of like an all-in-one device and this cloud-based platform, so you don't have to fiddle with any software to process your data. And also they're you know, working on implementing these AI algorithms to um, detect certain you know, pathological states. Um, you know, their early research was distinguishing Alzheimer's dementia from uh, you know, regular mild cognitive impairment associated with aging. And, um, and so it's cool to see just their vision and how, you know, how forward looking they are and that they really want to get the two big brothers of pharma and uh, insurance sort of on their side and that, you know, they've really positioned themselves to at least try to do that. Um, and it was cool that it related back to everything else we were learning about signal processing. Like, you know, Regine was talking about how we need to transform data into basically videos so that we can uh, make use of the existing machine learning algorithms. And then, you know, we got to see that, yeah, I think actually did just that. And they figure out a way to, to convert EEG into a, you know, a, a 2D image without losing a lot of the resolution. And that that's what they're using to train their AI algorithms. Um, so yeah, you know, and and it was a, it was a really wide range. That was only a part of it. We had you know we had some people, uh, Michael Pierce, um, Rusty Turner, who got really deep on a lot of different issues related to sort of environmental and EMF toxicity. Um, you know, Michael Pierce, amazing uh, chiropractic functional neurologist who knows a lot of stuff about different. Uh, biological factors and potential biological insults that might be impeding someone's progress in doing their own feedback. Um, and Rusty is a seasoned, um, I think, pediatric neurologist who has, I think, only in the past five, 10 years gotten into the EEG world and um, was just presenting on all of the concerns that we have with EMS and like the fact that, you know, just like in the neurofeedback world, the research hasn't really caught up to the technology. And in this case, sort of in the negative sense, like we're still learning just all the ways that, um, you know, cell phone towers and Wi-Fi are affecting us and we don't need to be paranoid or conspiratorial, but we should, you know, try to educate ourselves and maybe, you know, turn off the Wi-Fi router at night or whatever it is. So it was, uh, that was an amazing conference, you know, and, and I'm really excited that on the last morning, 
we got together and, and Regine is sort of organizing us as a team in order to essentially create a you know, scientifically written uh, report and summary of that conference so that can be published in no regulation. Um, so uh, I have a feeling there's gonna be more you know, conversations um, in public about that, you know, on YouTube and on, on various places around the web about what went on, but there'll also be publication from the ISNR that people can look into. Um, so it was a ton of fun. You know, it's like from from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, you're having awesome conversations or listening to, you know, awesome talks or like drinking great wine and like getting invited onto boats and getting invited to people's fun houses. So uh, I would recommend it. And uh, we're going to make it happen next year. Jay, you got any thoughts on Sue's son? You want to uh, touch on that? Well, it's really quite an honor to have 70 folks pop in for your birthday and to hang out for three and a half days talking about EEG and QEG and uh, the future of uh, what we're doing and again kind of an immersive experience um yeah Sassoon city is a town of uh, 29,000 people it has two little tiny hotels we we basically took over uh one hotel and there's no venue in either hotel that would hold 70 people in a room i mean these are small you know hotels so uh, the yacht club uh, here in town, uh, basically uh, set up for uh, us. We took over the yacht club for the week, and uh, the the uh, fabulous facility for this. Um, and the, the <laughs> as soon as there's a break, there's a bar. So uh, the, uh, the 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 hall itself sat uh, seventy people quite comfortably uh, with tables in front and. Uh, uh, the, the entire event was videoed. Uh, it's going to take a while to get that all uh, pieced together with uh, PowerPoints interlaced with images of the speaker and images of the people asking questions at the microphone and all that. So that there, you know, there, there's a few months worth of process uh, uh, probably to get that as a product. And then it's going to be three and a half days worth of film. So uh, the, the, you know that just scheduling time to look at it is going to be a a, a difficulty. So um, anyway, it it, um, it it seems to have picked up um, an inertia all of its own. Uh, we did not advertise at all about the event because there's the the facility is too small, and you know just the. Uh, the immediate, uh, the immediate word of mouth amongst uh, a relatively close group of people that have been consulting online. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences NeuroGuide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend online or in person with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. And if you sign up now, you can join Dr. Robert Thatcher at his house for a pre-course get-together December 9th. It's going to be a blast. What a better way to enjoy winter by being in Madeira Beach, Florida and earning up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen NG hyphen workshops. Uh, for two hours every other week going over EGs and, and uh, you know, online, that, that those kinds of small groups basically all convened. It was, um, it was a little odd having people introduce themselves as I'm Jay's Thursday, and oh, I'm Jay's Tuesday. So, uh, uh, but uh, the uh, it it was a a very warm group. Everybody had uh, uh, EG as their focus. There wasn't any odd 
politics back and forth between any vendor groups or anything like that. It was all based on signal, not necessarily hardware. It, although Mary Tracy is totally fried from having done it and probably won't be immediately involved in doing anything for anything going forward. Um, uh, when I talked to the Yacht Club and told them that, uh, unfortunately, we'd be kind of limited because 70 was the total max they could hold. Uh, they, they basically said, you know, we've done weddings with a few hundred. We set up giant tents outside. <clears throat> so uh, it, it may end up being done at a level that we could actually let people know about so people that were interested could come. Uh, as opposed to uh, kind of not uh, not promoting it, not talking about it, because you don't want to end up having to uh, uh, kind of shoo people away. So, but it it, it turned out uh, as a I think a real fabulous event, and um, it was the first experience I had with three D people for quite a while. So, uh, well, that's what a lot of people don't get. Jay is we came to you, we came to the master to Susan city yeah. and, and your birthday. And that just shows the commitment and the loyalty and uh, the respect that everybody has for you, man. So I know you hate this stuff, but you got to know as a newcomer checking it all, it, it was a, uh, it was a great pilgrimage. I, I recommend it. I think, I don't know how I got on the invite list, but I'm glad I was there. Uh, and it reminds me of the old days of the internet where, People just wanted to get together to connect and share what they know to help expand uh, the, the reach and, and, and the knowledge for, for everybody. So um, I don't want to oversell. I don't want to undersell. It's a it's a fine line. But if you can be a part of it, I mean, it reminds me of going to Omaha, Nebraska and Warren Buffett's uh, pilgrimage that he has out there. It's like Jay, Jake Uncleman is the Warren Buffett of neurofeedback. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> well, I've been called worse, I'm sure. <laughs> so, Nikki, you brought up uh, Saybrook University, and uh, there's not a ton of programs out there that get into the you know the neurofeedback side of things. How did you find it? There's some new kids that are you know an undergrad you're like hey you know i want to take this to the next level can you give us a little clue on what uh, saybrook is about well i found it because if you go for long enough uh saying that you're excited about something but you don't find a job in it eventually your parents start to uh you know kick you in the pants to like get a real degree and can find a real job actually how i found it um i'd heard i'd heard about it and uh and i discovered that some of the people in you know, basically the study group that Joe Castellano started had um, had attended, um, had a couple of friends from the group who were really cool people who had done their PhD there and done done research on, you know, just really interesting topics um, that were, you know, really on the cutting edge of uh, neurostimulation, neurotherapy um, entrainment. And uh, so it seemed like a cool spot. And I spoke to some of the people from the program and they seemed really sweet. And uh, I learned that Jay Gunkelman had been part of it, that in the development of that program a few years ago, as well as Dave Seaver. At that point, I was like, I'm, I'm all in on EEG and on neurofeedback and neurotherapy. And um, yeah, I think it's only one of two programs in the US, the other one being uh, University of Texas, Austin, um, that really yeah, has- San a program. Antonio, yep. San Antonio. Right. Dr. Mark Jones. Good to see you, my friend. Can't yeah. tell the draw at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mark is great. I, yeah, I got the chance to meet him for the first time in Susan. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to me, it was like a no brainer. It was online and the professors seemed cool. And um, yeah, it was a, it was a, the first semester was a little bit of a wake up call, like just realizing that uh, it's been a while since I've like done homework. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and also you know like uh the people who i had spoken to about the program had done the phd and uh, their experience was like being surrounded by people that were way more experienced than they were and going into the masters and just having been part of these study groups i found myself pretty well prepared 
and you know like already interested in these kinds of things so it's a, it's a cool program it's a small program you know there's like 60 people in the whole department at the masters and phd level including the professors and so the classes are small and you have a lot of individual attention and um you know they they want to support you and 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 doing research on really whatever you want to so long as you're rigorous and sort of smart about how you design your study so um i'm only in my first year but like i've had a lot of um support and just enthusiasm from professors and other students about what I'm excited about uh, researching. And we've also started a, a student group. So we have like a little club where we basically like look at EEG cases and just talk about different stuff. And we're um, going to start like kind of like a group research study so that those of us who are earlier on in our degree can basically like conduct a research study together and get published on something before we work on our own like master's thesis. Um, so yeah, it's a cool program, you know, it's like, it's different to be all online. It, it's a, uh, it's in some ways unfortunate not to be, be forced to like run into people. Um, but at the same time, like having started this student group and, you know, now having these kind of informal meetings, I feel like we've sort of recreated some of that just to have, time to kind of get to know people and chat about whatever. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, uh, I recommend it. Like if, if you're interested in it, talk to Cynthia Kerson, um, you know, talk to anyone in the program. Like they're, they're, they're doing it because they love the field and they're curious and they have just a hunger for knowledge and for helping out with research. So if you're excited about the field and like, you know, connect with them and, and see if it would be a good fit and connect with students, you know, like the people who are in the program, I'm sure have, uh, you know, valuable lessons to share about how to make it work um, for you personally and like whatever your goals are. Um, and the other thing I would mention is, you know, it's, uh, it's not just a program about EEG and neurofeedback, psychophysiology really, applied psychophysiology really encompasses a lot more than just that. Um, so there's, basically sort of three different focuses. You can choose one on more biofeedback um, and or just sort of straightforward psychophysiological recording. Uh, another one more on applied EEG neurofeedback type stuff. And then another one on hypnosis. Um, and hypnosis was something I didn't know anything about before I started this program. And I've had a really awesome time uh, learning about it. And I, I think it's a really valuable uh, clinical tool. Um, so check it out and, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me or, you know, any of the professors if you want to learn more about it or have questions. Jay, can you help me with my tangents here? How did you get involved with uh, Say Brook and how did that develop? How did they get you? What, you know, you have University of Texas at San Antonio and then you have Say Brook. I'm sure there's a couple others out there, but those are the two main ones. How did they, how did they how did you get involved? There was a there was a PhD program. Uh, the Behavioral Medicine Research and Training Foundation had a PhD program that was being hosted in New Mexico at a university that was about to be accredited, and they 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 came together assuming that accreditation would occur. When the accreditation did not occur. Um, uh, the, the PhD program on applied psychophysiology uh, needed to find a, a, an accredited university to host their PhD program. All of the individual courses within it were all APA accredited for CE credits, but you needed to have a, a, a degree program to host it. Um, and uh, Rich Sherman uh, approached me to be on their board to assist them in finding a university to host. And um, I had uh, previously, uh, 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 Saybrook isn't just uh, mind-body medicine, there's other uh, uh, sections of that university. And um, I, I had gotten a grant uh, from a, a refinery for a business-related a, a grant for a project at Saybrook. So I knew the president of Saybrook, uh, then in, an interim president uh, of Saybrook, and I invited him to a lunch. 
I presented him with a spreadsheet showing him if you know if you had this many students paying these kind of things and these are your overhead for the instructors and this is the spreadsheet of you can actually make money uh, hosting this PhD program and we've already got it already pre-packaged all the instructors all the coursework AP accreditation for all the courses and so forth and and uh, he said what's not to like this looks great uh, uh, we're just finishing our reaccreditation so we don't need to do this immediately about six months from now uh, we'll bring it in after our reaccreditation and then It'll, it'll be integrated in fully. So that's, that's how they got there. And um, uh, you know, Don Moss, uh, who had been president of AP, APB, uh, is their kind of dean of the mind-body medicine group. And he's doing a fabulous job. Um, uh, the, it's an interesting non-residential uh, university. Uh, they, they do have high high standards and the students that are in it are uh, from all over the world, actually. We've, we've got an international uh, student body there. Um, and uh, they, they do come together a couple of times a year for, uh, our, they call them an RC, that, uh, but it's a student and, and faculty get together. Um, and they've, they've done it in Monterey, California, um, uh, basically taking over a uh, hotel, uh, their uh, students and faculty and uh, you know, the meals and whatnot. So um, it, it's an interesting gathering of the, their tribe a couple times a year. And, uh, I believe they usually try to do one of them at an AAPB meeting when those used to be done in person. So um, uh, I'm sure COVID uh, threw a little wrench in all of that too. Um yeah, so I, this one was sort of a follow up on the presentation at Susan that Makoto and Michael gave, sort of about the art of dimension, about and about what we lose by converting data into a two dimensional spectrum, where you have you know voltage on the y axis and the frequency on the x axis. Um, so you know, given that we lose sort of like some of the labile and intermittent features of the EEG by doing that, um, you know, like aside from looking at the raw EEG, what's next if we want to make, you know, database comparisons and how can we represent, you know, the time dimension a little bit more faithfully with, you know, other, you know, uh, transformations? Um, it's all about basically giving you uh, uh, an image that you can interpret. And the Fourier has been a classic, but the Fourier has some assumptions. It assumes everything that it's, that it's evaluating are sine waves. Well, you've seen enough EEG. Is it all sinusoidal? Come on. There's sharp things and odd shaped waveforms here and there. So it's not all sine waves. It assumes there's no transients. Well, you've seen EG. For God's sakes, it's full of transients. And it assumes no state changes. Well, people go in and out of state all the time. Wake, a little drowsy, a little spacey, you know, a little dozy, a little sleepy, a little awake, a little agitated. You know, the state changes all over the place. So the very tool that we classically use to analyze the EG doesn't match the EEG, the EEG doesn't match its assumptions. So, you know, you've got to find something that doesn't assume, assume stationary, the permanence of the sine wave. Well, something like, oh, a wavelet, uh, a, a wavelet analysis allows for transients to be evaluated very easily. And it doesn't assume any specific wave shape, it responds to things that occur with a certain periodicity. And, uh, you know, you can uh, generate the joint time and frequency display and recover the time dynamic that's lost in the Fourier. 
you know, the a, a Fourier will give you this a spectra with a spectral peak. For instance, a, a, a 10 hertz uh, sine wave, you get a, a, a nice peak at 10. Well, was that one, in, in a, a, a section of time, was that one big burst of 10? Was that a nice hum of 10 across the entire, uh, entire recording uh, time? Uh, both of them give you the same spectra. Yeah, you lose the time dynamic entirely. So, um, you know, the joint time frequency displays end up giving you that kind of data back. And, uh, um, and wavelets don't have the uh, funny assumptions that uh, you, you have to have some stable state or something. They simply reflect what's going on within whatever state you happen to be in. So um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing to kind of uh, switch to uh, more nonlinear um, uh, 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 approaches, and the data analysis tools that are available now, uh, independent component analysis for uh, uh, extracting artifacts to clean up the data set, so you're not processing. You know, subtle artifact. You know, historically, we, people would cut out big eye blinks that you would see, but in between every eye blink, you you you, you could cut out little tiny saccadic eye movements in the the periodicity of about eighty milliseconds. Little tiny tiny eye twitches happen all the way through the EEG. When you do ICA cleanup, it takes out the big blinks and the small saccadic eye movements. So. The EG is going to be changed, but it's essentially super clean. And if you didn't use that technique, you've got subtle eye movement left in your data set. So, you know, the, the, uh, the, the modern tools that are available now uh, for data cleaning and data analysis that are shareware. I mean, EEG Lab is not uh, a $10,000 tool. It's shareware. So... Uh, um, and it's it's universally used academically, so you've got kind of standardized tools. So uh, you know it's it's interesting, I think, to end up having uh, something where the tools used to cost a small fortune. Uh, the the first QEG machine uh, we had was the. Spectrum 32, 160 something thousand thousand dollars. Uh, had to have four of them in the lab. So, you know, it, it outrageously expensive. And now more power in analytic software for free as shareware. Now it has to use MATLAB or uh, apparently there's, there's uh, uh, maybe a Python or something that can end up using it as well. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how all that works out. Rogene's on top of that. Um, it, it it's extremely uh, fun for me to see uh, people that have uh, studied EEG with me. I'm a student as well. Uh, it end up transcending what I've done and probably what I'm ever going to be capable of doing. I'm uh, uh, not on the ascent here. I'm uh, I'm I'm retired and <laughs> slowly fading away. So um, it, it, it's exciting to see uh, the, 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 the leading edge of the field being developed with, um, with a, a still a solid base uh, tied to the raw EEG values, um, not, not just running off on, on some mathematical and analytic uh, uh, rabbit hole, you know, so we're, I think uniquely positioned to see uh, some uh, some solid progress. Given that there's such an emphasis on um, signal processing, and that so many people are, you know, essentially trying to create various automated algorithms for artifact removal, and then you know, on an even further level, you know, detection of particular pathological states, right? I think doing that with Alzheimer's. And obviously it's a goal to be able to do that with a lot of different conditions, not just one, so that we can uh, find patterns in larger, larger data sets and 
you know, potentially um, find patterns that we don't uh, recognize as being problematic now that could perhaps be like an early detection system for particular, you know, pathological states. So, you know, you've already touched on this, but like, where do you see the role of the EEG technician, given that some of these products, you know, that like the iSync Wave are sort of designed to remove some of that um, manual labor and, and it, both in the putting the cap on and in the signal processing in favor of something that's more automated and also more consistent so that they can have a more you know, consistent data set? Well, uh, uh, the, uh, the orientation isn't only towards pathology, but also towards optimal performance. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the tech is going to be involved in that data processing. And to the extent that you end up having lots and lots of options of how to analyze, it's going to be important for the tech to be knowledgeable enough to know which one of the tools to use. You know, uh, if you go into a master woodworker's shop, it isn't just one hammer and one saw. I mean, you you, you end up having a, a, a panoply of tools that are a, a subtle differentiation between them. Uh, this isn't just a chisel; it's a gouge, and you know, there's there, uh, uh, specific tools for specific jobs, and uh, um, knowing which tools to pull out of the analytic tool belt and how to apply them and when to apply them. Uh, do you do this before uh, these other processes or after these other processes? Uh, which, which steps do we do in our cleaning? Um, how do we know we're not throwing away an epileptiform burst as, a, as though it's an artifactual uh, um, moment? And um, you know, the... The, the, the tech is still going to be a, a, an important aspect of it. And experienced techs um, uh, take time to develop. You know, um, it, it's not hundreds of studies, it's thousands of studies. And you, you saw, for instance, Ron Swatsina. Uh, uh, and he, he and I had worked together for a few thousand EEGs. Uh, before now, he's out operating essentially on his own. Well, there's a few thousand gives you uh, uh, enough confidence to sort of uh, start to think about helping others, um, uh, but it takes a few thousand, and that that doesn't happen fast. Um, it, it takes time. Now, the study groups, uh, uh, two hours here every other week, um, you know that that builds up some uh, background. Uh, but it, it takes time and uh, uh, an experienced tech that knows what to do and how to do it uh, ends up being a valuable uh, uh, person. Uh, uh, I, I know Santiago Brand is um, call, calling himself a glorified tech. Uh, and, and to me, I find no more glory than being a tech, you know, uh, 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 being a tech has served me well, so... You bring up Santiago. He reached out the other day, Jay. He said, hey, man, I want to come back on the show. I'm going to drink a couple cups of coffee. I said, whatever it takes, Santiago. <laughs> you know, he's in Singapore. Yep. Hey, Nikki Whitridge, thank you so much for coming on the Neuro Noodle podcast. Hell yeah, man. This is a lot of fun. Let's do it again. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. A special thanks to our gold and silver supporters. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences NeuroGuide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. And if you sign up now, you can join Dr. Robert Thatcher at his house for a pre-course get-together December 9th. It's going to be a blast. What a better way to enjoy winter by being in Madeira Beach, Florida and earning up to 16 CEU hours. 
Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. MindMedia.com. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit MindMedia.com now. Thank you.